Hello and welcome to the History Hour podcast from the BBC World Service with me, Max Pearson, the past brought to life by those who were there. This week from the 1930s, how Italian imperial ambition turned to mass slaughter in Ethiopia. I could see the piazza, the square, Menelik Square, and there people were running, Italians were shooting people, killing people. It was a massacre. Also, the fate of Christians persecuted in the Korean War. We are all scared. We heard a lot about them persecuting the Christians and they tried to persuade them to the communism. If they do not, they will punish people. Plus, how the human body was plastinated in the 1990s and violent bigotry in 1980s America. I can only describe it as mirroring the Islamophobia that poured out as a hysteria in America after 9-11, except back then it was anybody who looked Japanese. That's all coming up later in the podcast, but it's in Italy that we begin with one of the greatest scandals in that country's post-war history. In June 1982, the body of one of Italy's most senior bankers was found hanging beneath a bridge in London. It was just the latest twist in a dramatic tale that had gripped the country for more than a year, and it seemed to hint that real power in Italy did not lie with the elected government, but in a secret state within a state. Luis Hidalgo has been speaking to a retired magistrate and to a journalist who both helped to expose what had been going on. It was a scandal that had everything. A secret Masonic lodge whose members included many of the most powerful men in Italy. The Mafia, the Catholic Church. I've been talking to one of the people who discovered this state within a state and to a journalist who reported on it. Our story starts, though, with the death of one of Italy's most important bankers. The body of Roberto Calvi was discovered hanging beneath Blackfriars Bridge at 7.45am on the morning of June the 18th. He'd been dead between two and six hours. On Calvi's body, the police found five lumps of At first, of brick. British investigators thought Calvi had committed suicide, but it later emerged he'd been murdered. Roberto Calvi had been the manager of Italy's largest bank. The Vatican was its main shareholder, a fact that earned Calvi the nickname God's Banker. On the scraps of paper found on his body, there were numbers and some names. Among the names was the head of another of Italy's largest banks, the Minister of Finance and a senior figure in the Vatican, someone who, in the weeks after Calvi's death, the BBC tried to talk to unsuccessfully. Hello, Monsignor. Yep. I gather that you knew Mr. Calvi. I have no comment to make. Would it be possible for us to meet and just at least talk about no. it off the record? No, no comment. Did you know Mr. Calvi? No comment, I said. You speak English. I speak English. Right. It was a very important story because many people didn't know what was happening in those days, in those years. Italian journalist Leo Sisti had already been looking into Calvi's bank and rumours of illegal currency dealings before his death and had found links between the bank and the mafia. We later discovered that his bank had, among their clients, mafiosi, and he received the money from the mafia. But it was another link of Calvi's that had emerged during an investigation into another bank that had sent shockwaves through Italy and revealed a shadowy state within a state whose influence reached to the very top of Italy's government and society. In March 1981, almost a year before Calvi's body was found beneath Blackfriars Bridge, Italian investigators ordered a raid on the properties of one of Calvi's associates, a man called Licio Gelli. Gelli was also a financier, by then in his 60s, and he headed a Masonic lodge called Propaganda Due, or P2. People knew that Licio Gelli was influential, Leo Sisti says, but it was only after that raid that it became clear just how powerful he was. I was uh, working at Nespresso at the time. What we covered was about Licio Gelli and the mysteries surrounding him, but only after the raid uh, carried out by financial police in Arezzo, we realized that a storm was coming. We knew not very much about the Masonic Lodge P2 at that time, but we knew that was something mysterious and serious. 
Giuliana Turani was a young judge in Milan who, with a colleague, had been tasked with looking into yet another banker, this one a Sicilian in jail in the United States with ties to the Mafia. It was that investigation that led them that March to order the raid by the financial police which uncovered Alicio Gelli's farmhouse, a list of the members of the Masonic Lodge he headed, P2, with more than 900 names on it. They called me by telephone and told me that they found the lists of P2 Lodge and that in that list there were a large amount of important names, the chiefs of the three secret services of Italy, many industrialists, many public servants. For instance, the main daily newspaper of Italy was controlled completely with the Lodge P2, and it was the Corriere della Sera. And there were government ministers too, weren't there, on the list? MPs, even the chief of the financial police. These were the police carrying out this raid. Their boss was on the list. Did the scale of P2's membership, its influence, surprise you? Of course, I was shocked because of the large number. I I couldn't imagine that... Even the chief of the financial police could be in that list. There was kind of a state within the state, powerful people who controlled secretly the nervous system of the country. Because the chief of police actually rang his people, didn't he, during the raid and said to them, this list is dangerous, leave it. But they didn't. Were you ever worried for your safety? If I were alone, it is very easy. A car comes in a street and I die an accident, you know. But we were two investigating judges. It's, it's not so easy. And we knew that uh, there was too much noise about our discovery. But you were worried enough to make copies of the list, weren't you, and, and put them in a secure place? We put them in different places, and then, after a few days, me and my colleague decided to go to the prime minister to show him that this was the signal of something very dangerous for our democracy. By now, word had got out that something important had been discovered at Lito Gelli's farmhouse but not the detail of what had been found. Giuliano and his fellow judge went to Rome to brief the Prime Minister. And his chief of cabinet opened the door and received us. And uh, we knew that his name was also in the list of Lodge P2. And of course, uh, and we knew that he knew that we knew that. Kind of funny, but actually it was a very serious situation. By this time, Licio Gelli had gone on the run. But for two months, the government refused to publish the list. Until, in May, a special commission ordered that it be made public. And journalist Leo Sesti says the extent of this political earthquake was revealed. Evidence that Lito Gelli was the real puppet master, the holder of the real power in Italy, because the political elite, as well as the most important businessmen of Italy, were in that list. And so Lito Gelli could blackmail everybody. It was a huge scandal, wasn't it? Many people resigned, including the entire government and the Prime Minister. And then a year later, one of the names on that list, the banker Roberto Calvi, who you know met Licio Gelli many times, was found dead under Blackfriars Bridge. And isn't that true that P2 members used to call themselves Blackfriar or Frate Nero? And I know that you believe the Mafia killed Calvi, but at the very least, that was a coincidence. Maybe it was coincidence, I'm not sure, but anyway, uh, I prefer to look at facts. Don't forget that in 1970, Lito Gelli was involved in an attempted coup, coup d'etat. When he was young in 1933, he became a follower of Mussolini, and then uh, at the end of the war, he became a collaborator of the American Secret Services, for example. So he was ready to exploit every situation, especially blackmailing people. And then, a brick after brick, he built a very powerful empire of uh, businessmen, politicians, everybody. Licio Gelli was detained in Switzerland the following year, but escaped, ending up in South America. 
he eventually returned to Italy, where he faced several charges over the years, including in 2005 for the murder of Roberto Calvi. But each time he was acquitted or had his conviction overturned. He died at his home in Arezzo in 2015. No one has ever been convicted of the death of Roberto Calvi. Luis Hidalgo was remembering the P2 scandal with the journalist Leo Sisti and the retired judge Giuliano Turoni. And what an extraordinary scandal that was. Joining us now from Rome is the journalist and author Philip Willen, whose book on the Calvi affair is called The Vatican at War. Now, Masonic lodges, which in the most basic sense are private fraternal organisations, have been around for hundreds of years. So what was different about P2? In Italy, uh, in the case of the P2 Masonic Lodge, it seems that they got together to conspire together to help one another in their careers and in particular to try and block the uh, advance of the Italian Communist Party that was the largest communist party in the West and people were very worried that it could actually at some point uh, win an election in the 1970s. You said that part of the idea, the ideological bent, if you like, was the uh, attempt to block the spread of communism. So was this, in effect, uh, a branch of a sort of right-wing conspiracy which was unfolding within the state, within the state in Italy? Yes, I think that really is the fundamental characteristic of this lodge. The person who who reorganised it, starting in the late 1960s, Licio Gelli, was a great admirer of Benito Mussolini, uh, and he seems to have remained true to his fascist beliefs right up until the end of his life. And clearly he set about recruiting other like-minded people, particularly people who could make a difference, uh, such as the uh, heads of the uh, secret services and senior military officers and judges and journalists and politicians. And basically the, the link between them all Uh, The fundamental link was that they all agreed something should be done to uh, prevent the growth of communism in Italy. Given that strand of uh, what was going on inside P2, it's tempting to ask, given that this was during the the Cold War era, were there outside forces who also got involved in P2? I'm thinking particularly, of course, of the Americans. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, I think Lee Trigelli had close links with American intelligence services uh, really throughout the post-war period, and he became increasingly relaxed about talking about that in his old age. Uh, I interviewed him uh, several times, and there was a, a noticeable thawing in his his approach and would uh, uh, candidly admit to, to meeting the representatives of the CIA in, in Italy and giving them guided tours and showing them around and generally being at their disposal. You, you have to remember the range of crimes that were associated with the activities of people who were connected to the P2. Actually, just this week, Italy's Supreme Court confirmed an earlier appeals court uh, ruling on the Brescia bombing 43 years ago. That earlier ruling said that the Italian Secret Services and the CIA and the P2 had all intervened to muddy the waters and get the investigation running along a blind alley and away from the truth, rulings that confirm the suspicion that P2, along with other conservative forces, uh, were involved in the strategy of tension in Italy, terrorism that emerged at the end of the 1960s and particularly in the 1970s. And basically the suggestion was that these terrorist atrocities committed by right-wing extremists would help create a sense of insecurity and fear in the population that would lead them to confirm the conservative and centrist political forces that had been governing up to that time. Uh, and particularly would steer them away from a leap into the dark represented by a vote for the Communist Party that could have led to the formation of a communist government in a country that was part of the Western Alliance and a a member of NATO. Philip Willen, many thanks. And we've put a photo of Roberto Calvi on our website. See what you think, but to my eyes, he looks as though he's come straight out of central casting as an archetypal associate of the mob. Search online for BBC Witness.